Hello and welcome to the solution of exercise 2 problem sheet 1. Here we take a closer look at the point group of C3V which corresponds to a 3D object pyramid with a triangular base. We want to describe its symmetry operation and construct the multiplication table. First we're neglecting the third dimension because sketches in two dimensions are a lot easier to make and we just imagine the third dimension is sticking out of the plane. If we draw the equilateral base of the triangle uh, of the pyramid we're uh, making our three different distinct points right here and we number them in order to make the notation clearer. Now we're asked to question ourselves what kind of symmetry operation leaves this structure intact? First of all we can think of the identity which of course leaves every structure intact. But then we notice that if we rotate by one-third of 2 pi we map this triangle onto itself. This in the same way the other way rotation by one-third of 2 pi leaves this structure intact so we have as other symmetry operations C3 and C3 to the minus 1. If we look a little closer we can also make our mirror planes for example this one right here we call it sigma 1 because the mirror plane intersects the triangle at the point 1 and we see also that this this symmetry operation leaves this structure intact mapping 3 to 2 and 2 to 3 and leaving 1 intact. So we have a mirror plane sigma 1. We also have two other mirror planes corresponding to the other intersection points namely sigma 3 right here and sigma 2 over here. The most difficult part of this exercise is probably the identification of the symmetry operations as symmetry operations of the point group OH. First of all we know that C3V is indeed a subgroup of OH. That means we can actually do that. We can identify those symmetry operations with symmetry operations described in list 1.1 in the script. But how do we do that? The crucial point is that we have to find an axis or a plane that leaves every point in OH invariant under the symmetry operations of C3V. So the first thing we do is we sketch OH. OH corresponds to the symmetry group point group of a molecule SF6. So we we make a sketch of SF6, we have S in the middle and an F sticks to the top and F sticks to the bottom. Then there are two F's going to the back. And two F's coming in front. All we do now is trying to make our equilateral triangles. The first equilateral triangle we note is the one over here. The second one we note is the one over here. And that's all we need in fact. Because then we can construct this diagonal axis which leaves every other point in this OH group intact. And we, we, by definition, we define this as the diagonal 1, 1, 1. All we do, is now, all we do now is to look at table 1.1 and make out the, uh, the symmetry operations defined by the coordinate transformation to the, uh, to the axis 1, 1, 1, which is perpendicular to our triangle. And we find that this is C1, of course. This is C3 x y z. This is C3 to the minus 1 x y z. This is inversion times C2 x y. This is inversion times C2 x z. And this is inversion times C2 x y bar. This was in fact the 
most difficult part of the exercise, the remaining two components of describing the symmetry operations of C3V are fairly easy. First of all, we want to see how these symmetry operations correspond to a permutation of three different elements. Of course, it's handy that we named our distinct points already, and now we want to see what happens. Where do these three points move when we apply the symmetry operation? First of all, of course, the identity leaves every element intact. If we rotate, we shift our our three numbers, and now we have to check in which direction. If we move, if we define C C three being this direction, we map one to two, two to three, and three to one. So we say this is three one two, and here we have it exactly the other way around. We have we have two three one. If we mirror at the at the plane going through point one, we leave point one intact and switch the other two. And the same way we leave two intact and switch these two. And here we leave three intact and switch the other two. Then we are asked to to um, to find matrices that correspond to the symmetry operations on any point in the plane. To do that, we first have to find out a suitable coordinate system, and it's convenient to take the xy coordinate system as the as the one with the correct basis vectors here. So how how does a two-dimensional basis vector consisting of x and y in the plane, x being this direction, y being this direction. How does a sim how does how do we construct matrices that corresponds to those symmetry operations? The identity is of course easy because it's the identity matrix. If we're trying to describe those rotations, we have to think a little harder. We have to define a origin. We define the center of that triangle as the origin, then we know that this is 1, this is 1 half, and this is square root of 3 over 2. If we, if we think of, 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 those, of those distances, it's easy construct the, to construct those matrices, then this is minus 1 half, minus square root of 3 over 2, square root of 3 over 2, minus 1 half, and here we switch those two, one half square root of three over two minus square root of three over two minus one half. And again, the mirror planes are also easy to construct. One half square root of three over two square root of three over two minus one half, one half minus square root of 3 over 2, square root minus square root of 3 over 2, 1 half, and here we have minus 1, 0, 0, 1. You can, you can check that by yourself by looking at it a little harder. In the next part, we are asked to do the multiplication table for C3V. And this is a very good example how to construct multiplication tables. We have e, c3, c3 to the minus 1, o, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3, e. We write those down just as we did in the lecture, sigma c, sigma 3. Now how do we fill this out? First, because of the, because of the, uh, the feature of the identity makes it easy to uh, write down the first row and the first column. We simply mirror what's written on top. How do we fill out the rest? The easiest way to do it, or mm, let's say the uh, way you don't have to think the hardest, is to simply multiply those matrices with each other and see what happens to them and see to which matrix it corresponds afterwards. The other way to do it is to use your imagination and look at the sketch. We do that right here. 
So we say if we rotate by one third and we rotate again by one third, we could have rotated one third to the back. Same way we construct the C3 over here. And if we rotate backwards and then forwards, or forwards and then backwards, we leave it intact. Now it gets a little harder, but it's still pretty easy. So if we if we mirror at sigma 1 and rotate afterwards by c3, we could have also mirrored at sigma 3. So if we write down sigma 3 over here, then we can imagine a rotation only rotates the mirror plane. So we can fill out the rest by simply switching it to the right and then we have sigma 1, sigma 2, and by the rearrangement theorem we have sigma 2, sigma 3, sigma 1. Because we can't have sigma 3 over here again and we can't have sigma 1 over here, so we have to have sigma 2. In the same way it's possible to fill out the bottom left part of our matrix. I do that for you, can validate it by yourself, it's of course a good exercise to check that again. Now to the bottom right triangle. Again by the rearrangement theorem it's, we can only use those kinds of operations again because we used up for every row and ev for every for every <laughs> column we used up every mirror plane. So we are only left with identities and rotations. We can imagine that mirroring two times at the same plane leaves our structure as it is, so every point is mapped to itself. And then with a little imagination we can conclude that this is a rotation counterclockwise and this is a rotation clockwise and here we have it exactly the other way around. So we filled out this multiplication table and in the last part of this exercise we are asked to do uh, to find the conjugacy classes. We do that a little more systematic than in exercise one. Again, the, the, the results I use here can be found on page 16 of the script. First of all, we know that rotations and reflections must belong to different conjugacy classes because of the inversion element being a part of our reflection. So we must have at least three different conjugacy classes. One containing the uh, identity, second one containing the rotations or at least one rotation and the third one containing at least one reflection. So first of all we think about rotations. Rotations among plus rotation with plus minus the same angle around the same axis belong to the same conjugacy class if we have a headiness changing element in our group. Yes we have that, we have an inversion, therefore C3 and C3 to the minus 1 belong to the same conjugacy classes. When when we look at our reflections, we use the rule that reflections belong to the same conjugacy class if we have a element of the group that maps the planes of reflection into each other. So, if we apply C3 on sigma 1, we end up with we end up with sigma 2. If we have sigma 2 and apply a C3, we end up with a sigma 3 and so forth. So this is possible and sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3 belong to the same conjugacy class. I want to repeat again the important parts of this exercise. There are three different important parts. First important part is we know how to describe symmetry operations now not only with our Schönflies notation, but also as a part of the OH point group, as well as a permutation of different elements, and with respect to a suitable chosen coordinate system. The diff most difficult part was here uh, to identify it as a part of the OH group, where we have to have, have, to have our sketch. Then 
we're uh, making this multiplication table. Again, there are two ways to do it. One way is to calculate these matrices, multiply them with each other and see what happens. The second one is to use our imagination and our sketch to fill it out. And the third part that helps us is our rearrangement theorem that says that in every column, every member of our group may occur only once and at least once. In the last part, we construct our contingency classes by looking at page 16 of our script. This was probably the easiest task. Thank you for watching. I hope this you found this helpful.